Now, this is a series about Jesus' parables, okay? Last week, we talked about, actually, the Magi and the flight into Egypt. Um, So that was kind of an epiphany passage. This passage today does not contain any parables, but it is, as I said in the prayer, the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. And so Jesus began with a very clear and straightforward message. And then as his ministry progressed, he began speaking in parables, expounding on this simple, basic message. But I felt that in this series, we needed to spend a little bit of time on this first, and then beginning next week and for the weeks to follow, we will be looking at Jesus' parables in the Gospel of Matthew. So this morning, Matthew 4, beginning at verse 12. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, The people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I was debating whether or not to include the first part of chapter four in this sermon first part is a fascinating story as well. It is the account of Jesus uh, going out into the wilderness and um, being tempted by Satan. It is about Jesus confronting Satan in the wilderness, and it's significant because it repeats a battle that had been fought and lost already thousands of years before by our first father, by our first representative, Adam. So Adam and Eve were given the command not to eat of the tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they disobeyed, and Satan won that victory. Humanity fell into sin. But this time, with Jesus going out into the wilderness and confronting Satan once again, this battle produced uh, dramatically different results. This time, Satan was defeated. He was defeated. And it was this battleground of the covenant of grace that Jesus fought in the wilderness and fought for our sakes so that we can have the gifts that I mentioned in our illuminatory prayer, the gifts of salvation, reconciliation with God, and eternal life. But now... Having been tempted in the wilderness, having won that initial victory, having endured this difficult preparation for his ministry, Jesus begins his ministry in and to this world. And I want to look at three things this morning as we think about the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. I want to think about the timing of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. I want to talk about the place of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And I want to talk mostly about his message. So we'll, we'll just touch on timing and place very briefly. And then we will land very firmly on what the message is and what the message is for us today. And so, did any of you catch in the scripture passage, what was the occasion of Jesus going to Galilee and beginning his ministry? It was the imprisonment of John the Baptist. It was the imprisonment of John the Baptist. Now, we know from Old Testament scripture, and we know from earlier in the Gospels, that that John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way of the Lord, to make paths straight. He was the um, penultimate to Christ's ultimate. He was the last prophet before Jesus Christ hit the scene. And so the occasion for the beginning of Jesus' ministry is John being imprisoned. 
Now, as I mentioned, John had been prophesied about 700 years before by the prophet Isaiah. John had been prophesied about 500 years before by the prophet Malachi. Jesus himself referred to John the Baptist as the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Now, with such an important figure in redemptive history, isn't it interesting that John the Baptist ministry only lasted about 18 months. Jesus' beloved cousin, the one whom God had sent to prepare the way before him, had been captured and imprisoned by Herod, who we talked about last week. Herod, just as a reminder, was the the ruler of Galilee. He was a wicked man who stood against the gospel a man who hated the gospel, a man who also hated John because John the Baptist was a proclaimer and a pointer to the gospel. And John the Baptist, actually, we learn later on in the gospel of Matthew, uh, got into trouble because he actually spoke the truth, words of condemnation to Herod himself, spoke it to Herod's face. He was uncompromising in his sharing of the gospel. Nevertheless, upon hearing about John's imprisonment, Jesus moved his ministry into Galilee. Now, we know from the gospel that already there were more people coming to see Jesus and and curious about Jesus at this point than there were coming to hear about John. And no doubt, that fact in itself would have tipped the religious Jewish leaders in Jerusalem that that Jesus was a threat. It would have prematurely upset them and forced their hand to take action against this upstart. And so Jesus decides to make his way to the more remote region of Galilee, where he will, at least for a time, fly a little bit more under the radar of the Jewish religious leaders. Now, Jesus, already now, as he begins his ministry, knows that his time is going to come. He knows that his time will come. It's inevitable, it's, it's necessary, but now is not yet the time. And so he goes to Galilee to forestall a premature conflict. So that's what I have to say about the timing of Jesus' ministry. Now let's look at the place of Jesus' ministry for a minute. We read in, at the end of verse 12, he withdrew to Galilee. And then in verse 13, it gets a little bit more specific. It says, leaving Nazareth, he came and he settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, in one sense, we could say that God's grace is manifested in the most unlikely of places. And I know, I know that all of us probably have stories and examples that we would point to to kind of affirm the truth of that statement, that God's grace is manifested in the most unlikely of places. But in this context, as we look at where Jesus chooses to begin his ministry, when we look at where Jesus chooses to invest his time and his teaching and his resources, um, it might puzzle us a little bit. Puzzle puzzle us a little bit because look, if, if you or I had been planning where Jesus could do his ministry to the greatest effect, where he could do his ministry to have the, the greatest um, potential for, for impact and influence, we would have almost certainly suggested Jerusalem, wouldn't we? I mean, Jerusalem for that area was the center of government. Jerusalem was a center of power. Jerusalem was where um, the people with resources and with education and with influence and, and connections, that's, that's where they lived, And so that, on the surface anyway, as we usually think about things, seems to be the, the most ideal place that Jesus could have gone. But that was not part of God's plan. Jerusalem would indeed come later, but this was not part of God's plan. He goes to Galilee instead. And actually, when we think about it, when we know a little bit about um, this area, it does make a little bit of sense that Jesus would have settled down in Capernaum where, where he would kind of establish his base of operations. 
Because Capernaum was where Matthew, the author of this gospel, the tax collector, had his office. Matthew was called as one of Jesus' disciples. Capernaum is also where Jesus called Peter, James, and Andrew, and John as well. In other words, this is the place where he found his disciples, his core group of ministry leaders that he was going to invest in over the course of the next three years. And so as I mentioned, this became the center of Jesus' Galilean ministry, And in other ways, this was a very strategic place to be for Jesus to minister to that part of Israel. By foot, he could access all of the western lands. By boat, he could access the the opposite side of the Sea of Galilee and also all the Transjordan region. He was able to move freely and easily in the entire northern part of the kingdom. In fact, Capernaum became so much the center for Jesus' ministry that that Matthew 9, verse 1, refers to it as Jesus' own city. But the most important point to remember about the place of Jesus' ministry is that it was in accordance to God's will. It was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, which we read in the very center of our text this morning in verses 15 and 16. So we've talked about the timing a little bit. We've talked about the place a little bit. Now we're going to drill down into what I feel is most important about this text, and that is Jesus' message. We're told in verse 17 that from the time Jesus began to preach, his message was this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And the first thing I want you to notice is that uh, in its simplicity, this is the very same message that was being preached by John the Baptist. Matthew 3 makes that very clear. This is the very same message that had already been preached by John the Baptist. And so not only does Jesus authenticate the ministry of John the Baptist, he also confirms to us that the gospel is the same in all eras. The gospel is the same in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It is the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The gospel is salvation by grace. The grace is appropriated and received through repentance and faith. And that grace is worked in us by a trust in the living God through Jesus Christ, the Son. So it is, so it has always been, so it always will be. The gospel is a salvation by grace. And so from this time forward, Jesus would, in a sense, expand and build upon the ministry of John the Baptist, but in a much more effective and influential way. Because... John could anticipate the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. But when Jesus himself preaches that message, it lends all the more urgency to the fact that the kingdom of heaven is not only near, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, Jesus preaches this message with the work he came to accomplish in clear view. He knew that that only months away were his crucifixion, his resurrection, the ascension, Pentecost. Only months away, Jesus' earthly ministry was the three meager years, just twice the amount of time that had been given to John the Baptist. Jesus' message to the Galileans is his message to us. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It doesn't matter where you are, place. It matters timing because we don't know what kind of time that we have on this earth This message that Jesus preaches to us is urgent. 
This is a decision that must be made. This is a decision that if we abstain from, we have already made the decision. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you don't like that kind of preaching, then what you're saying is you don't like the preaching of Jesus. If you reject that message, you're rejecting Jesus. The one who gave himself to suffering and death so that we could be redeemed is the one who preaches this word to us, repent. And so, because it's so important, what I wanna answer this morning is the question, what is repentance? What does it mean to repent? Now simply put, if you just want a definition, if you just want what this means in the Greek, simply put, it means turning away from our sin and turning toward God. Now it's more complicated than that, but basically that's what it means. It means turning away from sin and turning toward God. Now the Westminster Shorter Catechism describes repentance as a saving grace. This is important. In other words, repentance is something that God has to work in your heart. Repentance is something that is God initiated and until God actually works in the heart, no one even has a desire to repent. Now, before you get all concerned as to whether or not God has worked in your heart and, and worked in your life, I want, you to, I want you to just know this. I want you to be assured that if you are even concerned about repentance, if you are even concerned about repentance, I can assure you that God has worked in your heart by the power of his spirit and is prompting you to repent. So don't worry that just because this is God initiated in a person's heart, you don't have to sit there and wonder and be concerned because just wondering and being concerned means that God has called you to repent and that God has given you, you the ability to turn from your sin and turn toward him. Augustus Strong once said, man truly repents only when he learns that his sin has made him unable to repent without the renewing grace of God. All we're saying here is that it is God who gives us the desire and the will and the strength to repent. And in repentance, what we receive is God's mercy. In repentance, we receive God's mercy. And I want to expand on that a little bit so that we truly understand. See, a repentant sinner is more than just sorry for his sin. Repentance is more than, than just an emotional state where, where we regret some of the bad things that we've done. Repentance is more also than, than just being kind of sad and regretful of the consequences of our sin. Like I did that bad thing and I reaped these uh, bad consequences and, and that's the reason why I feel bad. Um, repentance is more than feeling sorry that you have hurt other people. Just feeling bad about hurting someone else, that's not true repentance. Now, maybe you've committed a sin that has totally ruined your life. Repentance is more than just feeling sorry that you have ruined your life because of the action that you've taken. Let me tell you what repentance is. Repentance means having an entirely new attitude of heart toward your sin. Not just your worst sins, but to all sin. To all rebellion against God. To all going our own way when we know full well that it is not the way that God has chosen for us. It is a new attitude of heart that despises sin. The truly repentant person is one who says, it's not my circumstances that are the problem, it's me that's the problem. My environment, my genetics, my experiences, none of this forced me to sin. None of this made me do these bad things. I did it, and so I'm the problem. 
I'm the problem. I'm the source of the problem. The evil that occurred in this circumstance came from me. I stand condemned for that, and I deserve to be judged. I mean, that's, that's harsh. That's a harsh reality to accept. That is a harsh reality to own, but that is part and parcel to true repentance. But see, it doesn't stop there. Because true repentance involves another aspect as well. Because true repentance, as I mentioned before, is a gift of grace from God. Because at the same time that a repentant sinner um, sees himself or herself clearly standing condemned, standing judged, evil, the source of the bad things that we do, the truly repentant person also believes confidently in something else as well. And it's something so catastrophic, it's something so glorious that it's hard to believe that these two things can even be held together. And it's one of the great mysteries of God. Only the person who is truly repentant is simultaneously able to say, I am the problem and but God is merciful. I am the problem, but God is merciful. The truly repentant person understands that God's grace is bigger than our sin. Even the collected works of our sin, even the collected anthology of our lives of sin, God's grace is bigger than our sin. The truly repentant person knows that though he deserves hell, God will receive him because the repentant person, by the grace of God, has come to see God as a loving God who forgives at the cost of his very son, his very son, Jesus Christ, who speaks these gracious, loving, urgent words to us, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To repent is to lean our full weight on the mercy of God. God who promises to receive even sinners for their greatest good and for his greatest glory. A truly repentant person has discovered that the only refuge from sin is not found in excuses or downplaying or denial of sin. It is found in the refuge of a God who will forgive at the cost of his son. And so we run to Jesus Christ as our only refuge, the only place where we can find and receive forgiveness and reconciliation from God. And I also want you to understand this too, because this is something that gets me down a lot, and maybe it gets you down as well. Understand this does not mean that we become perfect through repentance. Sin, unfortunately, continues in the hearts of those who are repentant. But repentance does mean that we can never again be complacent about our sin. We can never decide and accept the reality that we must coexist with it. So in something I read this week, (coughs) it wasn't a commentary per se, But it was a story of a farmer who had a terrible temper. He terrorized his field hands. He brutalized his animals. His wife and children lived in fear of his uh, explosive and unpredictable temperament. And then as an older man, this guy um, heard and received the preaching of the gospel and he he was brought to Christ. He was crushed by the realization of his sin, and he (laughs) thankfully came to Christ. Well, here's how the story goes. Three weeks after his conversion, he was working in the fields, and and one of his field hands made a mistake that that caused one of his um, animals, one of his livestock, to get injured, and the farmer just exploded. Exploded. 
He exploded with the same language and with the same abuse and, and with the same intensity as before. I mean, he just blew his top, but then suddenly he stopped. He burst into tears and ran back to the farmhouse where his wife was working in the kitchen preparing supper, and he threw himself on the kitchen table, just this big, sobbing, heaving mass of farming humanity. His wife turns around and says, darling, what's the matter? And he answered through his tears. He said, honey, I... I'm no different than I was before. I'm no different than I was before. I just made the same mistake. I just did the same thing that I repented of. To which she responded, my husband, there's all the difference in the world in you. You never repented of your sin before. You were never broken by your sinfulness like this before. I can clearly see your change of heart. I can clearly see your change in behavior. I can clearly see your change in attitude. There is all the difference in the world, my husband. And so that leads me to the questions that I want to leave you this, with this morning. Has your attitude towards sin changed? Does it continue to change as you um, follow Jesus and, and as part of following Jesus have uncovered more and more little nagging sins in your life? Does your attitude towards sin continue to change? Have you repented? Have you repented? Have you fallen on your knees? Have you leaned all your weight into God's mercy? Have you come to the point where you no longer defend yourself and the only place you look for refuge is the forgiving love of the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ? Have you turned your back on sin? Have you gotten to the point where you can never be complacent about sin again? Have you run to Jesus Christ, your Savior, as your only hope? That is repentance. The last thing I want to say about it is that repentance is not just a one and done experience either. It's not just something that we do one time when we stand up here and make profession of faith. It's not something that just happens when we decide to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. John Blanchard says the Christian who has stopped repenting is the Christian who has stopped growing. Facts are the facts. We continue to battle against old sins and sinful patterns. We struggle with new sins and sinful patterns in different seasons of life. It's just amazing because they seem to come out of nowhere. So we have to be vigilant and we have to do the work of guarding our hearts. We need to be honest with one another and and in humility accept correction from brothers and sisters in Christ, from people who we trust. We need to be attuned through devotions and prayer to God's will and purposes, and we need to be diligent about that. We can never again be or become complacent about sin. Has God worked the grace of repentance in your heart? Is there any sin in your life that you have been ignoring or making excuses for? Let me tell you this earnestly, there is no sin that you can defend yourself of. You can try and obscure it in the eyes of others. There may be very few people, if any, in the entire world that know about your sin, but I can assure you that God does. And I can also assure you that you cannot protect yourself from that sin. Only Jesus Christ can protect you from that sin. And only if you throw yourself at his feet in repentance with confidence in his mercy, only then will you know what it is to find protection and healing and an almighty God who is waiting with open arms to enfold you. As I mentioned before, this is one of the great mysteries of life, that precisely when we discover how extensively we deserve judgment. 
We find that God has given that judgment to his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and King. Amen. Let's pray.